Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract 1. In this part of the test, you will hear Dr. Jean Matthews interviewing Michael Fraser, a patient with a recent problem. Good morning, Michael. Um, come on in and take a seat. Um, my name is Jean Matthews. Well, hello, Doctor. Well, uh, can you tell me what's brought you here today? Well, to be honest, I haven't been feeling well for the past week or so. That's no good. What sort of symptoms have you had? I've had a fever for a few days. It uh, comes on worse in the afternoons as well. Mm -hmm. I have been feeling a bit nauseous as well. And are you taking anything for that? Uh, Panadol, things like that? No, I haven't. Uh, I've just been trying to tough it out. Okay. And what about your eating habits? Um, have you noticed any change to your appetite? Yeah, well, I don't seem to be as hungry. I haven't been able to complete my meals without feeling a bit sick. Mm. And uh, with the nausea, has it ended up in vomiting? Yeah, I did vomit actually, both yesterday morning and this morning. That's one of the reasons I thought I'd better come and see you. Okay. And what about any other aches or pains generally? I'm feeling a bit, little bit tired and I've had a few pains in my joints and uh, I've been a little bit stiff in the mornings. Mm -hmm. And have you noticed any, any other sort of changes um, such as yellowish skin or in the whites of your eyes? Well, I didn't, but my wife commented this morning that uh, mm. she thought um, my skin had turned a bit yellowish. Mm. And what about the colour of your urine? Um, any changes there? Well, now you mention it, I, I do think it's become darker in colour. Mm. Okay, I see. Now, Michael, I'd just like to get some background details before we go any further. Um, could we start, just start with your age, please? I'm 38. Are you married? Yes, I am. And any children? Yeah, I've got two children. And how old are they? I've got a daughter who's nine and a son who's 11. Oh, lovely. Okay. And what about your employment? Um, what sort of work do you do? I'm a carpenter by trade. I see. And uh, you work mainly on building sites and places like that? Well, I do work on building sites, but the company I'm currently working for now has quite a few overseas projects, so I do go overseas quite a bit with my work. Mm. And whereabouts have you worked recently? Well, this year I've been to East Timor and I've just come back from New Guinea about uh, 10 days ago. Mm, I see. Okay. And uh, just tell me a little bit more about your general health. Well, pretty fine, I think. I eat healthily and I haven't had any complaints. And uh, do you smoke at all? I do smoke, but I try to keep it under control. Suppose I smoke about 10 cigarettes a day. Mm, okay. And uh, what about alcohol? Well, I have a couple of beers most days, but my wife and I are trying to be responsible and have a couple of alcohol-free days each week. Mm, well, that's an excellent idea. Okay. Very good. And now, just to go on to your family history, um, what about your parents? Are they in good health? Yeah, they're both in quite good health. Um, my father... He retired a couple of years ago, but he's fine. And my mother, she's well, she does have high blood pressure and she does take some medication for that, I believe. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and do you have any brothers or sisters? I've got three sisters and they're all well. Okay, good. Well, Michael, your blood pressure is certainly excellent and um, you're not overweight. Oh, I'm pleased to hear that. Mm, but what I do think, based on your symptoms um, and the jaundice and everything you've told me, I'm a, a little concerned that you might have hepatitis A. Really? Mm -hmm. Well, 
you know, this is not something to be greatly alarmed about, but it may be connected with your overseas travel. It's spread through fecal oral transmission, and it may be that you've, you've touched something or, and that's been contaminated, for example. So you think I might have picked this up on one of my overseas trips then? Mm, so yes, it's very possible. Um, when you travel, do you eat the local foods? Well, actually, because I do travel a lot, I am aware of the risks and I'm very careful with what I eat. I try to only eat food from the hotel and on this particular trip I didn't eat out in the marketplace mm -hmm. and I always drank bottled water. Okay. Well, look, I'm sure you did take proper precautions, but um, even when we do this, it's still quite possible, you know, sometimes um, the hotel staff may not have practiced the, the level of hygiene required. Um, they might have touched utensils or food that you've eaten, and that's how this can be picked up. So, I oh, see. Well, this is a real nuisance for me, Doctor. If I've got this hepatitis, what can I expect to happen now? Well, uh, the first thing we need to do is confirm this diagnosis, and for that you'll need to take a liver function test. I see. Boy, age 10. Now take notes on the case history and current symptoms. So your GP suggested you bring Tony in? Yes, we've had a very bad night. He's had hardly any sleep, wheezing, out of breath and coughing. I was really worried, so I rang up Dr Cooper. Does he use a blue inhaler? Yes, he's had one for years. But it didn't help? Not this time. Is his asthma normally under control? Well, he's had it since he was four. I was worried about him going to school at the start, but he seems to manage most of the time. Have you any animals at home? No, he wanted a pet, so we got him a cat, but it made his condition worse, so he had to give it away. Have you noticed if he's allergic to anything else? Well, we try to keep dust down in the house. Who did you see about Tony's asthma in the first place? We were sent to St Mary's and he had lots of tests to see what he was allergic to. And what were the results? Oh, uh, he was allergic to lots of things. So he was put on Intel, was he? Yes, he took that for years regularly, but a year ago his asthma got worse and our GP changed inhalers. Does he now use a brown inhaler? Yes, he uses it regularly. Is there anyone else in the family with hay fever, eczema or asthma? Oh yes, my mother had asthma all her life. I had eczema as a child. On my husband's side, several people have hay fever. Has Tony had any illness apart from asthma? No, fortunately not. That's enough. Has he ever had to come into hospital before with a similar attack to today's? Yes, they put him on steroid tablets. Another time, he was rushed into intensive care and put on a machine to help him breathe. Has he a nebulizing machine at home? Yes, and a peak flow meter. The asthma nurse showed us how to use it. What is Tony's usual peak flow rate? 300. And what was it today? 100. He's been very restless all night and breathless. He took more and more puffs, but he's just the same. Does anything special bring on one of these attacks? It seems to be when he gets a cold. Mmm, that's very common. Well, Tony, I'm going to bring you into hospital to get you sorted out, all right? Thank you, Doctor. That's a relief.
That is the end of part A. Now look at part B. Part B, in this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you will hear people talking in a different healthcare environment. For questions from 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You will have time to read each question before you listen to the audio. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now look at question number 25. Question 25. You hear two doctors having a discussion about chemotherapy for bladder cancer. Now read the question. Doctor, could chemotherapy inside the bladder reduce recurrence of cancer? According to a recent study, patients who had the chemotherapy drug gemcitabine placed inside their bladder following the resection of the tumor had few recurrences. Put of more than 400 subjects, 384 completed the trials and were included in the study, which randomized them to receive the chemotherapy drug called gemcitabine. To treat the bladder cancer, they implanted it into the bladder and let it settle there for an hour in the other group with saline without gemcitabine in it. They kept the patients under observance for every three months for two years, thereafter every six months for another couple of years. What they observed was the recurrence were 34% less. The purpose of this study was to prevent bladder cancer from invading the muscle wall of the organ. Moreover, this is a very simple method without any significant side effects. Question 27. You hear two doctors discussing occupational therapy for improving visual function. Now read the question. Doctor, can visual function be improved through occupational therapy? Well, findings proved that occupational therapy for patients with poor vision performed at their home and directed particularly toward helping them with both meaningful and challenging tasks helped avoiding depression that actually improved the visual function as well. It was observed that those with milder visual impairment actually performed much better on these questionnaires after the occupational therapy group, whereas those who were in the supportive therapy attention control group could not improve their visual function measures. Therefore, the occupational therapy role not only improved in some of these depressive symptoms, but also in this specific subset of patients with mild impairment did improve their visual function as well. The comprehensive approach to rehabilitation, including in-home occupational therapy for those with visual impairment, is the key to improving visual function. Question 28. You hear two doctors talking about why primary doctors should not perform eye screening. Now read the question. Doctor. Why shouldn't the primary care doctor perform eye screening of the patients? Well, according to the recent recommendations of the United States Preventive Service Task Force, the primary care doctor shouldn't include a vision screening to the list of primary tests for his patient in his office. 
To know why vision screenings may not trace out the precise vision impairment, we need to look at the factors that can restrict the effectiveness of the results. Many vision screenings are performed only for distance visual acuity and it does not give any indication of how well the eyes work together or focus up close. It also does not give any detail about the eye health. Although certain screenings may include a plus lens test for farsightedness and eye coordination tests, even these screenings will often fail to detect many vision defectiveness. Often, a vision screening is conducted by primary doctors or administrative personnel who have little training, who haven't the complete knowledge to assess screening results, even if the screenings are performed in pediatricians or primary care physician's office. The scope of vision screening may be restricted by the type of lab equipment. Question 29. You hear two doctors discussing dysphagia after the use of breathing tubes in ICU patients. Now read the question. Hello, doctor. Is trouble with swallowing common following use of breathing tube? Breathing tubes are meant to save lives, and they are often used for critically ill patients as well as during various surgeries. However, using breathing tubes has a side effect of difficulty in swallowing called dysphagia. In the ICU, patients had breathing tubes down their throat, typically more than 48 hours, will have a minor difficulty of swallowing and some voice problem as the tube is pulled. If it becomes worse, it can last years afterwards. According to the findings, most patients in this five-year study recovered from their dysphagia within six months. However, there are also cases of the condition lasting up to five years. The good news is that even in patients with the prolonged periods of dysphagia, ultimately they did recover some function. Question 30. You hear two doctors talking about risk factors for kidney donors. Now read the question. Doctor, how risky is donating one of our kidneys? Well, there is an online risk tool to calculate the long-term risk of end-stage renal disease in people who are willing to offer kidney donation. This tool includes many characteristics in contrary to single characteristics used earlier. This multitude of characteristics help develop a comprehensive picture of risk in donating a kidney. This tool incorporates 10 different characteristics that are specific to the person willing to be a donor and provides an estimation of the absolute risk of end-stage renal disease over a certain period of time, say 15 years. That is the end of Part B. Now look at Part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you will hear two different extracts. In each extract, you will hear health professionals talking about For specific aspects from 31 of their work. to 42, choose the answer A, B, or C 
which fits best according to what you hear. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now look at the extract one. Extract one, questions from 31 to 36. You hear the doctor briefing his juniors about different types of chest pain in female patients. You have 90 seconds to read the questions from 31 to 36. Chest pain is one of the common health issues from the patients in medical OPDS that causes a lot of anxiety in the patient as it is often connected with a heart attack or angina and people are well aware of the severe consequences of the symptom. However, a chest pain is not necessarily caused by or originating from the heart diseases. There are numerous other structures in the thoracic cavity. Therefore, a systematic approach is crucial to arrive at the correct diagnosis causing the chest pain. A chest pain in menstruating females has a great significance, as they are less liable to get heart diseases until menopause. Estrogen prevents the development of atherosclerosis. Coronary artery disease or myocardial infraction is very rare in menstruating females. As menopause approaches and estrogen levels decrease, the chances of development of coronary artery disease increases. Reversible loss of blood supply to the heart muscle called angina pectoris or cardiac pain is retrosternal, poorly localized, vague, heavy, squeezy feeling, compressive. Angina pectoris rarely lasts for less than one minute or more than 20 minutes, unless it is a heart attack. Patients are relieved in less than five minutes on the use of sublingual nitrates or cessation of all activities. Angina pain can also occur in the left arm, left shoulder, the jaws, or neck. Sudden blockage of an artery supplying blood to the heart muscle called myocardial infraction would be similar to this but very severe and lasts longer. The pain will not be relieved by sublingual nitrate or rest and the symptoms are palpitations, nausea, vomiting, perspiration, blackout, dizziness or even mortality. Pain that is unlikely to be of cardiac origin is often well localized, lancinating, prickly, sharp type lasting for less than 15 seconds at times. It can also be an aching type but mostly will be aggravated by coughing in deep inspiration. Often, the patient will be able to localize the pain with the tip of the finger. However, the pain that is localized just below the left nipple will never be from cardiac origin. Common causes of chest pain in young females. Mitral prolapse is a common and benign condition. Leaflets of the mitral valve are lengthy, redundant, and bulky. They prolapse into the left artium during systole. The causes of this pain are unknown. The pain occurs at rest, non-radiating, prolonged in duration and sharp.
Mitral stenosis or rheumatic valve disease is a common rheumatic condition in females and can cause dyspnea and chest pain. The patient will have symptoms like expectoration, a cough, and there would be low-pitched rumbling diastolic murmur that will clinch the diagnosis. A 2D echocardiography will be confirmatory. Now look at extract 2, questions from 37 to 42. You hear a doctor briefing his juniors about blood transfusion. You have 90 seconds to read questions from 37 to 42. Extracting blood or blood components products from one individual and inserting them into the circulatory system of another individual is known as blood transfusion. Therefore, the blood transfusion can also be considered a form of organ transplant. Generally, it is performed as a treatment for different medical conditions, such as massive blood loss due to surgery, trauma, shock, and other conditions in which the body tissues are not oxygenated adequately. Where carbon dioxide or other toxic materials are not effectively removed, and where the red cell producing mechanism fails. Great care should be exercised during a blood transfusion to make sure that the recipient's immune system is compatible with the transfused blood and also that the donor's immune system is compatible with the recipient's immune system. Moreover, blood type classifications A, B, AB, and O, and the rhesus factor classification, positive or negative, should be verified. Nowadays, a number of tissue type factors are also considered to determine histocompatibility. These tissue type factors become increasingly crucial in patients who receive many blood transfusions as their bodies have to develop increasing resistance to the transfused blood. Depending on the needs of the community, at the time only parts of the blood are taken for transfusion. Blood is composed of red blood cells, platelets, and plasma. The platelets and plasma can be donated separately in a process called apheresis. In this process, blood is separated into components after being extracted from the donor. For instance, albumin protein is transfused for treating burns and platelets used for treating hemophilia, cryoprecipitate, and immunoglobulin antibodies are transfused for treating immunological disorders. There will not be transfusion-related risk factors for the blood donor while transfusing the whole blood, besides the minute chance of infection or injury to the site. However, this is a certain risk to the donor when he donates plasma and has red blood cells reinfused. However,
This risk is preventable by following appropriate sterilization procedures. Significantly, it has caused severe public health hazards in China where they were often unregulated. The plasma collection centers of the U.S. are the best known examples of safe apheresis donation, which is maintained by pharmaceutical companies, involving paid donors up to twice a week. Interestingly, veterinarians occasionally perform blood transfusions to animals. Different species require different levels of testing to ensure a compatible match. Cattle have 11 blood types. Cats have three blood types. Dogs have 12 types of blood. Pigs have 16 types and horses have 34 types of blood. The experimental and very rare practice of interspecies blood transfusions is known as a form of xenograft. That is the end of part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.